We will change our energy strategy, the words of Royal Dutch Shell, following a court ruling forcing it to cut its emissions. A clear victory for environmentalists. But what does it mean for the oil and gas industry? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Peter Dobby. It is a landmark case brought by climate campaigners. For the first time, an oil giant has been legally obliged to adjust its policies to save the planet. British-Dutch multinational Shell now says it plans to speed up its plans to cut greenhouse gas emissions in response to that ruling. Last month, the company was ordered by a court in The Hague to reduce emissions by 45% by the year 2030. That's a much higher reduction than the firm's pledge to lower its emissions by 20%. The lawsuit was filed in 2019 by seven activist groups and more than 17,000 Dutch people. Environmentalists say Shell is obliged to bring its business into line with the 2015 Paris Climate Accord. The Shell CEO, Ben van der Burden, said the company will appeal against the ruling. He added, for Shell, this ruling does not mean a change, but rather an acceleration of our strategy. We have a clear target to become a net zero emissions business by 2050. We will seek ways to reduce emissions even further in a way that remains purposeful and profitable. Well, an estimated 1,800 lawsuits related to climate change are being fought over in courtrooms worldwide, and climate activists are preparing to take on even more companies. Environmental groups and local authorities in France have filed a case targeting Total Energies. Major oil companies are also making changes as they come under growing pressure to cut their emissions. Chevron investors have voted in favour of a proposal to cut its emissions, while shareholders at Exxon elected two climate activists to the company board. Well, the industry's operations are estimated to account for 9% of all human-made greenhouse gas emissions. That includes methane that poses a global warming threat more than 25 times greater than that of carbon dioxide. Oil is estimated to release one-third of the world's carbon emissions when burnt, while gas produces one-fifth. The drilling method of fracking is known to contaminate drinking water sources with chemicals that lead to serious health diseases. There's also the risk of oil spills that have a devastating impact on marine life. An explosion at a BP oil rig in 2010 released more than 130 million gallons into the Gulf of Mexico, causing one of the world's worst environmental disasters. OK, let's get going. Let's bring in our guests. In Amsterdam, we have Nina de Pata, lead campaigner at Friends of the Earth in the Netherlands. In Bern, we have Cornelia Meyer, an economist and energy analyst. And in Rome, we have Lorenzo Fioramonte, a professor of political economy at the University of Pretoria and author of Wellbeing Economy, Success in a World Without Growth. Welcome to Inside Story. Nina in Amsterdam, coming to you first. Does this mean that the big polluting companies around the world, the companies around the world who are taking chunks out of the ozone, now in effect have a duty of care to all of us? Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think many... Uh, we showed with our, with our case against Shell that, that uh, a big polluter such as Shell can no longer continue uh, causing dangerous climate change. And this is a very strong signal also to the other companies that are responsible for a lot of uh, CO2 emissions. Cornelia Meyer there in Bern. National courts legislating internationally, because that's in effect, I guess, what we're talking about. The business, is that good or bad? Well, it's new. I mean, it, it's something that has happened in the US for some time. It's really not happened that much in Europe. But the climate, climate change debate is a global thing. So we shouldn't be surprised that it's happening. Um, it's going to be tough for companies to comply. And, um, you know, sometimes it's very much uh, a, a first world thing. It's, it's easy to see how this can work in the first world. We also need to see, look very hard at what it means in the, um, the emerging economies and what it means, you know, for energy poverty and so on. Lorenzo in Rome, will we expect 
to be able to see more litigation around the corner. But, I mean, it'll be a long, slow process. Presumably, we're talking about a time span of years here, but it will happen, I guess. Of, of course it will. I have to congratulate the Dutch courts. This is not the first time they do it. In 2015, the Netherlands was the first country that accepted a lawsuit from environmental organizations against the government for not doing enough against climate change. That was the first time. And after that, thousands of courts around the world have done the same, in New Zealand, in parts of the United States, and so on and so forth. Now we're taking, you know, they've taken on companies. And I think it's going to happen again and again. If you think about the fact that they started in 2015 and in 2021, they've already ruled on a number of levels that things have to change and that both governments and companies have a direct responsibility towards the rights of citizens in this field, I think it's not going to be a long process. They've been quicker than politics. Nina, back to you in Amsterdam there. Is it your understanding of this that this ruling only applies within Europe? Because global warming doesn't respect borders. Global warming doesn't respect different jurisdictions. And I guess that's a problem for the courts and the companies that we're talking about and international governments as well. Yeah, I think um, that's something that we, we acknowledge in our, in our case uh, against Shell and uh, also the judge acknowledges. Um, climate change is not something from within borders. It's, it's a global uh, phenomena and especially the impact is of course being seen already in the global south, uh, although the causes are mainly in the global north. Um, and that's also why this is such an interesting and such a, an important uh, verdict, because it applies to Shell all over the world. So Shell has to reduce its CO2 emissions with 45% globally, um, on average globally. So uh, maybe Shell will move a bit faster in Europe and uh, slower in other places in the world. But on average, 45% in 2030, which is a big step, but it is also a necessary step, because this is what science says that needs to be done to avoid dangerous climate change. Um, so it is a global verdict, although it is done in the Netherlands. And, and that's a big precedent. That's a big step forward in uh, in our fight against climate change. Uh, and, and therefore, I think, it, it, although the, the, the headquarters of these companies are often in Europe, in the US, um, but their impact is globally, as well as this uh, verdict. Cornelia, speculate for me. Um, after your appearance on this programme, you're offered and you accept the job as CEO at Exxon in America. You now run the company. Exxon is well known as having been a climate change denier. They spent a long time as a corporate strategy saying, it's not real, don't worry about it. How do you tweak and alter Exxon to make it come in behind what the oil and gas industry has to become? Well, I think uh, that's a very good question, and 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 it 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 goes at at one thing because the European companies have actually been quite good. If I look at Shell, Shell was one of the first companies that didn't just look at their CO two emissions, but also looked at the CO two emissions of their clients. Um, BP has gone down that route recently and Total has gone down that route and the European companies really are revamping the oil companies to become, um, you know energy companies to do more renewables and so on. And the American companies are really lagging behind. So if I was Exxon, I would work very, very closely with the European companies just to get the right measures in place and to do more in terms of beefing up, of redefining myself away from an oil company to an energy company. This being said, you know, it's great. I, what, one of the things I'd like to see is that we look a little bit more, um, not just at, at, at the overall impact, but we should also look at the, the environmental impact of uses and sources of energy for the full life cycle. So I would like to see what do EVs, electric vehicles, for instance, what does that mean from, from you know, designing them through decommissioning them? And I think there's still a lot of work to be 
be done in order to really look at what the impact of various energy sources and uses are over the full life cycle. Not saying that we all need to change and we all need to adhere to the um, 1.5 degrees centigrade over pre-industrial levels um, of global warming. Lorenzo, for poorer countries or countries that are asset rich when it comes to fossil fuels, oil, gas and coal, etc., but they are fiscally in a, a precarious situation, I'm thinking about countries like, say, Nigeria. Is this actually a curse for them? Because their entire economy, well, 80, 90 percent of their economy is based on oil or gas. No, it's not a curse. We have to realise the fact that many of these countries have been... Um, oppressed and in a way, you know, abused by these companies. I mean, otherwise Nigeria would be now a very rich country. So the, these countries, Nigeria, Mozambique, Angola, I know this country having lived 20 years in Africa, none of these countries have ga has gained out of this. Um, of course, the pollution and destruction and inequalities have generated contradictions. I'd just like to remind everyone that Luanda and Angola is one of the most expensive cities in the world. Angolans cannot afford a house in Luanda because oil companies are basically pushing up the prices. Um, and it's still a country very unequal, ravaged by a conflict, and so on and so forth. Mozambique is having now a re-emerging civil war because of gas explorations, and Shell, Total, ENI are at the forefront of that process. So these countries didn't get a good deal out of this. Now, the question is, can we get a good agreement internationally that as we move out of oil, we're also going to pay reparation costs to countries that had to bear the burden of the wrong source of energy uh, without benefiting directly from it. So I think I think it's an opportunity to help these economies diversify. They have suffered from what is known as the Dutch disease. You know, the oil and the, the gas and other natural resources have been a, cur a curse, not a blessing for these countries. And now it's an opportunity to change. So let's not present it as, as a risk for these countries. These countries have already paid a high price from having been exploited because of what lies under their ground. Nina, do you trust uh, the other oil companies around the world, the oil companies, the gas companies, and I guess the, the companies that are still involved in coal mining and fracking as well, to do the right thing? Because can I suggest to you, Nina, that the um, Shell, the Royal Shell CEO, actually got it right when he said, look, we cannot do this quickly because if we stop taking the oil out of the ground, the demand is still going to be there, so somebody else will meet that demand. Yeah. I think this is a very difficult topic to address because we, we cannot look into the future. Although we try all the time, we are seeing that building up pressure on fossil fuel companies, not just Shell, but also the other private and national companies are being put under pressure, increasing pressure. Um, so this was, this was a, a, a historic verdict uh, that will indeed lead to Shell uh, having to change its business uh, and maybe other companies are interested in their assets. But let's not forget that all of the, almost all of the countries in the world signed the Paris Agreement. So almost all of the countries in the world want to avoid uh, a dangerous climate crisis to occur. Um, so there are ch things changing, and this verdict can be a very important uh, acceleration of this transition. So other companies might think in a very short term they, they could win from this, but if we look at the global transition that is going on, then, then all the oil and gas companies really have to uh, take a step back and look at their business model. Is this a sustainable business model? Can they continue going on like this? Not in the long term. We, we, we need to move away from uh, oil, gas and coal. They know it. They know, they've known it for a very long time. All these companies try to be the last man's, man standing. But this verdict shows that that is no longer possible, not for Shell, but also not for other companies that might be the next one going that, that, that are sued. Um, and hopefully they will if avoid uh, having to go to court um, and change their business model already. Or governments will, uh, will take their responsibility and say, no longer within our borders. Cornelia, depending upon how individual organisations react over the next year or two or three, perhaps, could this be a win-win for the big multinational oil and gas companies? Shell share price went up. That feels counterintuitive. I would guess that if a ruling goes against a company, the share price should 
go down, but if they handle it properly, they can actually make money out of this because surely the price at the pump, when I go and fill up my car, the price at the pump might go up and also the price per barrel at an OPEC level might go up as well. Well, I would say that the reason Shell and all other oil company um, uh, share prices have gone up is that you've seen this year alone um, oil prices to go up by more than six, uh, by more than 35 percent. And if you compare it to a year ago, it's a hundred and something percent. So that's that. And I look at the European companies and they've actually been quite responsible and they have all, be it BP, be it Total, who's now no longer want to call itself Total, but Total Energies, be it Shell, they're redefining themselves as energy companies doing a lot more on, on renewables. The one thing where I'm a bit concerned is, and, and, and this works, again, it works for the first world, but I'm a bit concerned if I look at the, at the at, at, you know, developing economies who still, you know, who still have energy, you know, poverty in many places, how can we go that quickly just substituting for hydrocarbons we may not be able to so we need to find a way a, a way of getting there and just one quick um, remark when you say that when you, one of your guests says oh the oil companies have exploited these countries i think if you look at shell if you look at bp they've been trying very, very hard to be responsible corporate citizens. No. But a lot of it is down to the elites of those countries who are not always um, doing the best for their populations. Lorenzo, you were smiling and shaking your head there. Do you want to briefly come back on that point from Cornelia? <laughs> um, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I think we live on two different worlds. I mean, just in, in, in Africa, there have been civil wars and there have been... Um, acts of social rebellion against the exploitation of the Niger, the Niger Delta, for instance, Nigeria, for centuries um, and previously. And, and now, you know, since at least the 1960s, against oil companies doing so, um, against Shell in particular. Uh, this is the history of Nigeria. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that a lot of people in perhaps in the rest of the world don't know this. I mean, people have been executed for rebelling against oil fields run by uh, European companies. Um, and the same happens in many countries. As I said now, as we speak, there is the emergence of a civil war in Mozambique. The, the country had been pacified after the civil war of the 80s and 90s, and it's because of gas explorations. And again, all exploited by European companies. These companies have already been indicted, have already been um, convicted so many times for many different um, activities. And now finally, there is a verdict that says you can also be convicted for not doing enough to reduce climate change, which is a threat to everyone. And I think one of the reasons why some of these companies will see their shares increase in value is because a lot of people, consumers, as well as shareholders, are understanding that the future of energy is without oil. So the quicker you change, the more valuable the company will be at some point. And this is not me saying this. This is the Stern Review. This is the World Bank. This is the IMF. Companies that own oil, that have oil, oil reserves, will have stranded assets. You know what that means? It means liabilities. It means that you're going to actually, it's like having something that you're going to have to pay for, not something that is valuable in the market. And I okay. think a lot of investors are realizing this. Lorenzo, I'll, I'll come back to you on that point about consumption habits in just a moment. I want to go back to Nina De Pata in Amsterdam. Nina, Quantify for me what's really going on here. We've got more than 400 cases like this around the world, excluding the United States. And the Columbia Law School today, with the Financial Times on their website, making the point that in the United States alone, there are almost 1,400 similar cases. So going, going through the American legal system, so that's 16, 1,700 cases around the planet. So something is changing here. We are pushing back either as individuals or through groups like yours. So quantify for me what that is. What is happening here? I think that the climate movement is, is getting stronger and stronger, uh, also through courts. Um, we see that governments are not doing enough, not protecting our, us citizens uh, against the climate crisis. Uh, and therefore, uh, people decided to take the to take their own future and say no we don't want this uh, anymore we are going to court because it's about our future um and i'm still young so it is actually about my future 
Um, so all these climate court cases, of course, together they can be extremely effective, but also the in individual ones. We were the first ones that uh, were successful against a private company and uh, and making sure that a company needs to change its policy. We also see a lot of court cases where uh, compensation for damages is asked. Uh, I think those cases are especially important for the people in the global south that are facing these damages already. Um, and we see cases against the governments. All of these cases together show that we are concerned and we know we, we you don't want to go to court. Going to court is one of the last resources. But we are at that, at that point now that the crisis is so is is so real that we have to do have to take these measures. Okay, uh, and that's growing, and every success leads to more cases. Um, but if I, if I if I can, I would like to respond quickly to what is said earlier about uh, the, the companies in Europe. Um, are the judge made very clear that that Shell is not doing enough? And I hear, I always hear this, but Shell is doing better than Exxon, or uh, the European companies are uh, are already doing more to to become more sustainable. I think they are mostly very good in uh, talking the green talk, but mm -hmm. the actions are lacking behind. Okay, uh, and that's I think something that we've proved this in this court case. Nina, I'm going to interrupt you because we are rapidly approaching the end of the program. Uh, Lorenzo in Rome, let's go back to that idea of consumption habits. Clearly, people, we, all of us on the planet, have got to change how we do what we do. Anyone who's lived and worked in America, good luck with trying to get people out of their SUVs and their three-ton trucks. If you live and work in the Middle East, like I do, you try and get people out of their Toyota Land Cruisers or their Nissan Pathfinders, not going to happen until the oil and the fuel runs out. Who does it? And how do you do it? How do you get people into electric smart cars? I think the question is not whether you need to replace one type of car with another type of car, although EV cars are better than in internal combustion cars. But I think the question is, is this the type of mobility we want? Um, what is lacking in the United States is a public investment on public transportation. I think those of us who live in Europe live happily, also the wealthy, without owning a car and uh, life is just better. We don't feel less developed than the US because we don't use personal cars as, uh, as much as they do. And I think, I think it's a matter of rethinking what it means to be a, you know, a, a developed country. A developed country is a country that does better not a country that does more. Spending hours and hours in a traffic jam is not a sign of development. And I think our friends from the Gulf, our friends from the other side of the Atlantic should understand that. The more we invest in public transportation, the more we do so efficiently with new technology, with different vehicles, using electric as much as possible, and rightly using electric that is based on good life cycle assessments. Okay. And we all have all the technologies and the methods, we'll actually be able to build a better society. Cornelia, coming back to you, I suspect, for our last point, the pressure is mounting in the oddest of quarters. I noticed today that the, the Church of England man who runs the Church of England pensions board, which has a financial link up with Shell, is saying, actually, this is really, really good news. Is it your sense, Cornelia, that this is a complete step change in the narrative to do with global warming and it simply cannot be denied and it must be dealt with? Well, absolutely. And I think when you look at it, when you look at ESG investment, ESG investment, environmental, social and governance uh, comp compliant investments is the fastest growing asset class in the world. And that's where investors are moving. By 2025, more than 50 percent of all um, you know, um, professionally managed money in um, in the US, for instance, with, who are the laggards, will be ESG compatible. So, and, th and that's really where this is going to. And that is also where the, the court verdict is going to. Um, if 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 um, companies do not become compliant with court verdicts, with uh, with new standards, um, it will be hard to attract investment. But then again, one of the things I just would like to say, and I'm glad our our colleague from Italy said that, is that we also need to lo look at the full life cycle investment because it's so easy to say, oh, EVs is better or this is better. We really need to look at what this means in terms of the full life cycle of any use or any source of energy. 
we have to leave that discussion there. That's a good point to end our thoughts today. Thank you all. Thank you to our guests. They were Nina Depata, Cornelia Maya, and Lorenzo Fioramonte. And thank you, too, for your company. You can see the show again via the website, of course, aljazeera.com. And for more discussion, check out our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can join the conversation on Twitter at AJ Inside Story is our handle from me, Peter Dobby, and the Inside Story team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. We will see you very soon for the moment. Bye-bye.